Previously on Drake Paragon. So this is how I cut my hair. Where'd you find him? Well, let's just go walk. Looks like seal, doesn't it? I can't stand it anymore. What the heck is this? So now we know what is in the blue box with the ship. There's a trimaran coming in under tow. That is some boat. I can help you with lines if you need. Thank you. Sorry, Lil. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everybody, it's raining in Greenland. We're in Karaktak. A few days ago, a sailboat came in here. A uh, trimaran right over there, rafted up to that huge red motor vessel. The captain and owner of the boat is a guy named John, who has an amazing history of racing mostly in trimarans, a lot of offshore racing. Many sails to Bermuda from Newport. As they came in, we helped them with their dock lines. And last night we had dinner together at the hotel restaurant. John said he'd be happy to give us a little tour of his boat and sit down and have a little chat. And I hope you find it interesting people that you meet when you're sailing around the world. Today, we're in Greenland. Hi, John. Hey, Hi, good morning. How are you? I'm great, thanks. <laughs> that sure was a fun evening. Oh, it was night. a lot of fun last night. That was great. Yeah, here and then on this. Thank you. Great. Or just one fell swoop. <laughs> How long have you had Avalanche? Uh, I bought her in the summer of 2011. 2011. That's when I went out there for the bike ride and came home with the boat. <laughs> wow, I want to hear that story. Yeah. <laughs> there was no place to properly uh, invest my money. Yeah. So I decided instead of taking any chances yeah. you know, on investments, I thought I would just invest in something that I know would be a bad investment. <laughs> we wipe fool around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's gonna cost a lot of money and just depreciate. Wow. Why not? I think it's worth the adventure. Oh, it certainly is. Some coffee or tea or anything? I'd love some. I never say no to coffee. Coffee or tea. Coffee would be great. Okay. Thank you. Welcome aboard Avalanche, the Trimaran. Main salon. We do all the cooking and yeah. planning, eating, navigating. Some of the other Hammerhead 54s I've seen, they have bunks running on the both sides. Yep. yep. Real proper bunks. Uh, but this isn't really set up that way. I mean, I dare say we've had crews sleeping on these, these bunks, but uh, they're not the most luxurious. So on this one, you've got the galley on the starboard side, an enormous galley. Yeah. A lot of great counter space here. Do trimarans heal? A little bit. The two outriggers are called amas. The boat kind of teeters on them. So they're not completely ever submerged until you're underway. Wow. And of course, the leeward ama is, is then in the water and the windward ama is always out. So she heals a little bit. Her motion is more like a power boat. Most sailboats sort of pitch and roll like that. She kind of pitches huh. like a power boat speeding through the water. Huh. I mean, there's a little bit of rolling involved, but especially in big seas, it's more of a power boat motion. Are trimarans generally faster than catamarans or of the well, same Well, they're certainly length? faster upwind. Aye. Uh, they go, go closer to the wind, and we have about a 30 degree tack angle. But at 30 degrees, we'll slow down to the speeds of a more traditional 
54 foot monohull. Hmm. She really likes to be cracked off 40 degrees. And the more you crack her off, the faster and faster she'll go. She loves the beam reach and she really loves a broad reach. Then she'll go a multiple of the wind speed. We're pushing past 30 knots. Uh, I can't even imagine. We've actually done that speed. twice. Uh, coming up to Cozumel, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the trade winds were blowing pretty hard at about 30 plus, and there were a lot of waves. But when we came into the, the, the lee of Cozumel, the water flattened out, but the wind still stayed, and we could just skim over flat water, and we went over 30 knots. Wow. We were passing water skiers and power boats, and, and one of those, you know, as a resort, one of those paraglide guys. Yep. And, uh, it was really kind of fun. Everyone was hooting and hollering. And, I can't imagine that kind of speed. That's unbelievable. And I was thinking about slowing down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But we could sustain a long passage with an average of 17 knots. Mm -hmm. I really think of her as a racer cruiser. Maybe she's a cruising boat that was built in a very Spartan way. So I think she can, you know, she can go either way. Mm -hmm. She won the Transpac twice. Wow. And of course, then she was stripped out pretty well. What year was she built? 1986. 86. She was the first hammerhead hull made. She was made in Wells, Maine. Hmm. And I believe she was built by the fellow who actually took her off sailing yeah. the first time. She's been around the world once already. Wow. So she has a bigger resume than I do. <laughs> is that your refrigeration there? It is. Right. It's got a freezing unit on one side, so if we shove things up that we want to keep frozen. Yep. If we put it in frozen, it, it'll stay frozen. Yep. Yep. Is it engine driven or just 12 volt or AC? 12 volt. 12 volt. Yeah. Oh, and microwave, lots of locker, drawer space, and then your stove here. Mm -hmm. Is that on a gimbal here? Yep. And your ship's library here on the port side, mm -hmm. movie library. We got a TV. We can hook up GPS. Aye. And so we can look at our course on a larger screen. On the TV? Down yeah. Here. When you're sailing offshore, do you always have somebody in the cockpit, or do you sometimes all come down here? Yeah, I like to keep people in the cockpit. A boat that can go as fast as this boat, if, if you don't keep someone with a pretty decent watch going, mm -hmm. you can get into trouble pretty quickly. Because you're going so fast. Yeah, especially if there are icebergs out there, yeah. or oh whales. Yep. Yep. In my career, I've hit six whales. Really? And it's never... A very pleasant thing. We no. damaged the boat and I don't think we helped the whale out no, much either. Oh my god, I can't imagine hitting a whale. Yeah, it does significant damage usually. So it's a good idea to, for uh, at least one person out there to keep watch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one person can s sail the boat really pretty well. Yeah. Especially offshore. I mean, once you start coming into a marina, yeah. it, you suddenly realize you're, you're trying to sail a tennis court. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's yeah, so it's beamy. So yeah, but she really comes onto her own offshore in blue water. Looks like you've got really good visibility from down below here in the salon all yeah. around. Yeah, the windows are pretty foggy now because of the weather, but uh, you can look out and she's been set up for single-handed sailing and that's pretty much uh, my forte. Single-handed sailing. Right. Most of my racing career has been either single-handed or very short-handed. And we don't sail really with more than four people mm -hmm. in the delivery. Four people seems to be a nice number, hmm. but uh, now I can I can sail the boat by myself. Yeah. With four people aboard, what's your watch rotation like? Well, we always talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not much of a, a dictator as a skipper. Mm -hmm. The crew I always bring on are just incredibly experienced mm -hmm. and a great crew. They all have a lot of great ideas of their own. So I like to chat with my crew and come up with uh, a best plan. I'm always the last decision maker, mm -hmm. but I like to talk to them. So to the answer to your question is, I'm not talk to them. We'd see how, mm -hmm. how good we feel, how much sleep they need. Mm -hmm. So and depending upon the weather, I mean, maybe three-hour watches, mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll decide whether we need one person out there or two okay. people out there. Mm -hmm. Of course, like most offshore sailors mm -hmm. do, we start the watches almost as soon as we leave port yep. and get that rotation going. Mm -hmm. Because uh, 
If we don't, we don't start the watch system during the day. At night, everybody will just bonk at the same time. Yeah. And they're not going to want to be out on watch, and they're not going to be very uh, diligent on watch. They'll be tired. So oh. three-hour watches give us a lot of mm -hmm. time. Now, these two storms that we hit coming up from St. John's yeah. to Nook, St. John's, Newfoundland to Nook, Greenland, we could only stay at the helm for an hour. Really? Yeah. It was it was that demanding on the it person was the, on watch. It was that demanding. Huh. Yeah, and uh, so we had one person out in the cockpit at the helm, uh, one person fully loaded in battle gear and harnesses and everything, sleeping on this bench as backup support for the crew on watch. Yep. And uh, that would be our first response. And if something is really happening, like we need to reef or, you know something needs more personnel then we'll start bringing up the off watch mm -hmm. but we were, we were down to one hour watches that's that's really all we could stand it was so cold and so wet yeah. uh, and so fatiguing yeah. wow. how long was your voyage from st john's newfoundland to nook well to get around the ice limits yeah uh coming from st john's uh we did about uh, 1200 miles mm -hmm. Uh, maybe a little bit more. Hmm. We're on a, a broad reach at first, mostly with a uh, easterly course, mm -hmm. until we, we turned the corner of the ice limit and then just started heading north up to Nook. Wow. So you went all the way around the entire ice field. Correct. Wow. We gave that ice a lot of berth. Yeah. yeah. Tons yeah. of room. I didn't want to be involved in a storm, ice, mm -hmm. whales, darkness. Right. All those fog. things at once. Fog. Mm. I wasn't quite sure I was going to handle all those things, so I just tried to avoid as much as possible. The first storm we hit, we hove to yeah. for about 17 to 20 hours, something like that. So that wow. slowed our speed down wow. quite a bit. The second big storm we hit, we decided to just put up the storm jib, triple reef main. Yeah. And we sustained a pace of about 15, 17 knots through the storm. But it seemed very controllable. Yep. This boat looks pretty radical, but she's she's not. Chris White designed a, a, a very, very seaworthy, fast cruising boat. She loves a, a beam reach and flat water, and yeah. then it's as close to flying as you can get in a sailboat. I bet. And this is your navigation station, your single sideband radio and VHF. Turn that on and it makes us look like a big ship. We'll come up as a big blip on somebody's radar. Radar, Hi. We went from San Francisco through the Panama Canal and up to Florida. And these Central American uh, countries, we would sail in looking to clear customs and that sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, it would alarm their local Coast Guard, they'd want to know what this big freighter was doing, like coming in unannounced and unplanned. Right. So they, I didn't realize why all the huh. Coast Guard kept rushing out to greet us. They thought you were a battleship or something. Or something. <laughs> and then they'd see us and they'd be a little bit annoyed yeah. because <laughs> we were just a, a sailboat making a loud noise. So after a while, when we figured this out, we, we turned off the CME when we started approaching country. So we just looked more like a sailboat. We got layers of backup navigation. We've got a, a Garmin out in the steering pedestal, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is really, really nice and really simple. I have the, a very similar system in my airplane. So when you're going fast, you, you, you want something simple. Mm -hmm. It's user friendly. You don't have to think that much. And then we've got two iPads set up with a complete navigation system. Hmm. And then we've got multiples of, of GPS, so if one layer goes down, there's another layer, and yep. a layer after that until we start getting down to handheld yep. GPS, yep. Yep. which has happened to me in my life. Layer yep. after layer after layer of Fail. systems just keep failing, yeah. and pretty soon you're back down to dead reckoning. Yep. Oh, gosh. We still carry paper charts, yep. and we still keep jotting our course yep. as, as we go along. So if everything does completely shut down, mm. uh, then we can start dead reckoning with a, a pretty good, an excellent idea of where we are wow. and where to go from there. Wow. I do the same in my airplane. I always keep paper charts out. A number of times I've, I've had the alternator drop out or we lose the alternator belt or yeah. everything electronic just goes down. And, and uh, my small airplane, 
engine is a lot like a diesel in that it can just continue to run fine mm -hmm. without electricity. Mm -hmm. So that's when you pull out the paper charts and you go, hmm, okay, we've got an hour and 10 minutes of fuel. <laughs> we've got to find an airport. Uh, hopefully with an airport with an AP mechanic and let's go. And, wow. and so that saved our butt many times. To being prepared to take over with dead reckoning. Right, yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with dead reckoning in the old school. The boat is really divided up into four cabins. Mm -hmm. This is the main salon, and up forward is crew berths. We have two berths up there, mm -hmm. and we've kind of enclosed them in with, with curtains, so you have your own private little space. Yep. So if you go off watch, you can close the curtains, you can keep noise out, you can keep light out, so you can get a decent sleep, or just have some privacy. It's always... Just like a warship. Yeah. yeah. So come on forward. Thank you. I'll show you. So two pretty nice bunks. We've got bars that we, we can put across the sides of the bunk. Not so much because she heals, yep. but sometimes at speed we'll go launching off of waves and, and get air. The crew that's trying to sleep off watch up in the bow yeah. will get airborne. So these bars will hold them into their, their bunks rather wow. than falling off. Potentially you can get pretty hurt. The bars slide out and then go up like this? Yes. Mm looks like a perfect sea berth. I really like the curtain for privacy. And I've got a reading light and a fan and a port. After our first leg from San Francisco to Cape Canaveral, Florida, one of my best buddies and his wife kept the boat and pretty much refitted it. Yeah. We didn't want to take the racer cruiser out of it. I, I prefer Spartan boats. Mm -hmm. I don't like a lot of frills. I don't like a lot of fancy woodwork. Yep. All those things you have to take care of. I yep. like it neat and simple and Spartan, Spartan. And, and clean. So when Renee and his lovely wife Sandy told me that they were made, making curtains for the boat, I immediately thought, ah, you see, the uh, curtains, come on you guys. And so they, uh, they did it anyways, and <laughs> it was a wonderful idea. <laughs> <laughs> wow. They also said, oh, you know, Skipper, you're going to need heat if you're going to go all the way up to Greenland and Iceland and, and that. And I said, heat, that's why we have, you know, really uh, winter sleeping bags and layers of foul weather gear yeah. and gloves and hats and... So I objected, but they still put in two layers of heat. We've got a little propane heater right where your feet are, where oh, you're standing. Yeah. And we've got a heat exchanger that comes off the, the diesel. Uh -huh. And boy, it has saved us. Oh, God, yeah. Completely saved. Do you use it when you're offshore as, as well as important? We use it more when we're offshore, actually. Hi. You know, going into these cold waters, as you know, it makes the boat condensate. Yep. So you can get damp inside. So the yeah. heat takes that dampness right out and Aye. keeps everyone a lot more comfortable. I see. That was just one of the improvements in Renee's wisdom, <laughs> my buddy's wisdom that he put on. He also uh, put a binami and, and, and total enclosure in the cockpit, which mm -hmm. I'll show you later. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, this is so claustrophobic. At a racing background, you would, like mine, you would never put that stuff up. It's just too much windage. Hmm. You would lose your advantage racing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, all right, all right, let's enclose the cockpit. And oh, man, it saved us. Countless times, you know, a wave would come rolling across the deck and hit this enclosure. And, mm -hmm. and we would sort of flinch and just get ready to get slammed. And we would stay completely dry and happy and warm. But if that, I don't know how cold that water is, but I bet it's... Uh, uh, in Fahrenheit, I bet it's in the 30s offshore. Jeez, yeah. Going past those icebergs and stuff. Uh, and I don't think we would have made it up here if we hadn't enclosed that room. And in honor of Sandy and Renee, the folks that built that, they're from Florida. Mm -hmm. so we call it the Florida room. The Florida room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I totally agree. Having protection from wind and spray and waves maybe in the cockpit offshore in horrible weather is, yeah. uh, can make a huge difference. And uh, you've got locker stowage, it yep. looks like, underneath here for... Yeah. As in things. most boats, are, it's kind of a premium yeah. for storage space. Yep. Uh, Some crew clothing, yep. locker. Yep. And yeah, I try to keep this area available so the crew can stow their gear. 
We've got some labels here. Mm -hmm. We've got a few other things for the boat, but I try, I try to create a, a, as enough storage space for the crew. Yep. It's yep. nice to have your own little nook and your and storage of your own stuff. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep it within easy reach. And then up here, we've got a forward head. Right. And it's a Levac head. Yeah. I really like how everything's all white. It really it makes it airy and well, it's easy to wipe down when it gets wet, as yeah. you know, from sailing up here. Yeah. Uh, either from rough water or condensation, mm -hmm. the, the boat is inclined to be wet. Right. So yeah, it's easy to just wipe down. What's that? That's the the pump out huh, for our, our holding tank. Mm -hmm. And is this? sort of like the wet locker space for, for the, the boat for the well not for the entire boat but for the uh, uh, the forward crew yep yep they can come in here and hook up their their wet phalles and, yep. and then just let them drip try and dry out while they they go off watch and they lie in their bunks so to keep the wetness away but you know I keep lines down here and you know, very often those are wet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it just sort of drains through that grate mm-hmm and then we just pump the water overboard. I see the little pump through the yeah. grate there. Yeah. What's forward of this bulkhead? It's just bulkhead? a watertight bulkhead. Yeah. Do you yeah. keep anything in there? N nothing. There's yeah. an anchor well up there, and we keep a anchor lines Aye. up towards the top. But uh, no, there's just a big space in there, watertight space. Wow. In case we hit something, then yep. the rest of the boat won't swamp. We won't sink, but we can certainly fill up with water. What do you call the side hulls? Amos. Amas. A M A. Amas. Yeah. Huh. It's uh, a term from the, uh, the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. You know, they were the folks, I believe, who who came up with uh, multi hulls and outriggers first. And so it's a name from those folks out there in the South Pacific. The people who invented it. Right. Wow. The starboard side is an AMA. A M A. Mm -hmm. And the port side is an AKA. A K A. Hmm. But most people just call them amas. Amas. They have watertight tanks. If you hit something and you crack the hull and water is getting in there, watertight tanks will still maintain flotation. It'll only get to a certain point, but so the integrity of the ama will mm -hmm. still be there and it'll still float. So Chris White made a terrific design. I've looked at all of his boats, and of course I'm biased, but I think yeah. this is the prettiest one of his designs, the, the fastest. Mm -hmm. I think it's his best design. He's made tons of uh, beautiful designs, uh, trimarans and catamarans, mm -hmm. but this is my favorite by far. Wow. What's the aft section? I'll show you. Yeah. Next on Drake Paragon.